Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you are. Welcome to the UN Plant-Based Food System Dialogue. This is the first ever such dialogue that's happening at the UN. And we are going to start off the process by talking about the Plant-Based Treaty. And before we begin, I'm going to bring Lisa Levinson, who is going to start us off uh, with an opening ceremony. Thank you, Lisa. Well, thank you, Silish, and I'm here on behalf of In Defense of Animals and the Interfaith Vegan Coalition. We're delighted to and honored to be able to do the opening ceremony today. So today I'd like us to start just taking something we all have, a couple of hands, and place them on your heart. And just take a nice deep breath, breathing into your heart, Inhaling and exhaling, and notice the gentle rise and fall of your chest as you inhale and exhale, connecting with our hearts, because today is all about that connection. It's all about our hearts. And I'd like to open with this intention for everyone that today is about creative solutions. It's about involving veganism in the conversation to visualize to actualize creative solutions for our planet based on a plant-based lifestyle, plant-based treaty, and on expanding vegan consciousness worldwide. So take a moment and breathe into that intention through your hands, through your heart. One more time, nice deep breath. And as you exhale, gently press your hands into your heart and just anchor that idea and that intention into your body, your mind, your spirit, and into this day today. Thank you all for being here and many blessings on this day, which will undoubtedly provide many creative solutions for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, as always. So welcome, everyone. We have uh, Eleanor Carrara and Anita Crank of the Plant-Based Treaty, which is probably the most important international treaty to have come out in the last year. And um, thank you, Anita, for initiating this, for conceptualizing it and making it happen. Thank you, Salash. It's such a pleasure to be here um, and, and talk about this initiative. Uh, it, it started just four months ago. Um, mm -hmm. It's modeled after the very popular grassroots uh, fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. Um, and it's uh, covering something that needs to be part of the discussions. And that is um, the role that plants can play in saving the planet. And our slogan is eat plants, plant trees. And uh, very much in line with the work you've been doing for years, uh, Dr. Salas Rao. Um, so we're, uh, what we're doing here is trying to create this bottom-up pressure by gathering endorsements from mm -hmm. millions of individuals, 10,000 groups, 10,000 businesses, 50 cities by 2023, uh, when there's a stock taking of the Paris Accord, and uh, pressure national governments to negotiate a global plant-based treaty and incorporate that in the global uh, you know, climate accords. Wonderful. So, uh, how is it going so far? Um, so, so far, we have uh, almost 10,000 individuals that have endorsed uh, 300 organizations, uh, including mm -hmm. many animal, environmental, and climate justice organizations. Uh, we have about 200 businesses uh, and lots of politicians. So, on our website, we, we have a list of politicians from around the world that have endorsed from uh, senators like Senator Jesus Rodriguez in Mexico mm -hmm. City, uh, many councillors in Bristol. Mm -hmm. We have uh, members of parliament in Australia from the Animal Justice Party. We have a Green Party mm -hmm. uh, member of parliament in Poland. We have the entire mm -hmm. Green Party in the Netherlands that have endorsed. So, you know, lots of political interest, which is great. Um, then uh, we have celebrities that have endorsed, like Moby. And, Wonderful. Uh, uh, in in Mexico, we have Rodrigo. Uh, he's part of a. Um, uh, he's part of he's part of like an instrumental group. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we have um, we have a number of celebrities in India um, and yeah, around the world. So it's very much a global initiative. And then we have scientists such as yourself. Uh, we have mm -hmm. Danny Harvey and Peter Carter, who are IPCC reviewers. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so we, we have athletes as well. So we have different categories of endorsers, and uh, they're all listed on our in the About section of our website. Oh, we also have two cities. I mean, that that was something uh, we, you know we're very happy to have. We have two cities: uh, um, Boyd, Boynton Beach in, in Florida, and uh, um, we, we we also have a city in, in Argentina that has endorsed. Wonderful. It's in front of senators asking to endorse it. And of course, we want Phoenix to endorse it. We want Pitt to endorse it. All cities to endorse it. Um, so Eleanor, we're on a letter writing campaign. Get the UN to, um, to acknowledge the issue and to address it. So how is that going? Well, uh, we started August uh, 9th with the first uh, letter. We had uh, 40 signatures uh, plus another five for the five uh, attendees, uh, including the, uh, the four who were removed from the call. August right. 30th, we sent another letter because we kept receiving uh, signatures. So that one had as well uh, 40 signatures. Mm -hmm. And um, on Friday, uh, we received um, the list from Lisa for okay. the Faith uh, Coalition, and we had 39 on that one. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it, and I think for now uh, we're we're going to uh, stop that campaign. We're going to see what happens uh, with the uh, the summit this week. We're mm -hmm. going to continue the petition for COP26 uh, with the various asks that uh, we put there in terms of uh, phasing out animal agriculture, uh, training farmers uh, to transition from animal farming to uh, plant-based uh, agriculture. So yes, um, it's it's been pretty busy. Uh, we've not heard a response yet from the Secretary General uh, as yet. Yeah, I mean, it's. I understand it is a process to filter up. <laughs> we are punch the whole bottom up, right? So that's how it's happening. Uh, it's just exciting to see. You know, I was surprised when the UN approved the summit, actually. I was shocked. Yes. So, <laughs> uh, but, you know, uh, clearly, ultimately, the truth wins out. So no matter what happens, the truth will win out. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Anita, what is in the treaty? So what are they signing up for? when people sign the treaty? So uh, we, we're asking individuals, groups, businesses, cities to endorse the treaty. And what that means is uh, simply uh, agreeing to the basic principles in the treaty and um, asking national governments to negotiate a global agreement. So that's, that's the minimal ask. Hmm. But beyond that, uh, there's also guides on, on, on the website that can help help you to uh, promote plant-based solutions in schools, hospitals, uh, businesses, and so forth. So that, so, but when you endorse a treaty, you're just saying you agree that there should be a global treaty, but you can go beyond that if you wish with all these guys. So within the treaty itself, there are three R's, uh, mm -hmm. three principles, and the first one is relinquish, which means like relinquish new uh, building of new slaughterhouses, Mm -hmm. new, new animal farms, uh, uh, new deforestation to, to expand mm -hmm. animal agriculture. So mm -hmm. basically the first principle is asking, don't make the problem worse. Um, and then the second principle is redirect from animal agriculture to plant-based food systems through the use of a number of policy measures such as switching subsidies from animal agriculture to plant-based plant foods, a meat tax, public information campaigns to raise awareness about the link between animal agriculture and the climate chaos, chaos crisis we're facing, as well as promoting plant-based solutions like recipes and things like that in a public information campaign. 
Um, and then providing support for community gardens and city orchards and addressing issues of equitable access to, mm -hmm. to uh, healthy plant-based or vegan food. Um, and then the third principle is restore or, and mm -hmm. re restore the earth, reforce the earth and rewild ecosystems that were previously used for animal farming. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would further solve the climate crisis by drawing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere into the best performing carbon sinks, which are trees. Right. Um, and so those are basically the three principles and we need all governments uh, to to endorse the, this this treaty and to start negotiations on a on a global uh, plant based uh, treaty uh, as soon as possible because we're facing as you know a methane crisis uh, emergency alongside right. the carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide uh, emergencies. Yeah, in fact, there was a um, I think they they signed something. The UK and the US signed something to reduce methane emissions by 30% from 2020 levels by 2030. You know, and and I know, I mean, as an engineer, I, <laughs> I've been following these numbers and uh, the reduction in methane emissions, methane emissions, mind you, not the methane concentrations in the atmosphere, it's methane emissions they want to reduce mm -hmm. by 30% means that the methane will be back to what it was 2010. So meaning it was increasing by 6% per decade as opposed to 14% per decade that it's doing now. Mm. So it's, to me, there is a lack of seriousness at the very high levels, you know, and they think that we, we will get fooled by these pronouncements that they are doing something when they say we're gonna reduce methane emissions by 30%. So, I mean, it comes down to basic high school mathematics, you know, and you figure out that they're, they're actually not doing anything. Um, so it's important to put pressure from the ground up, and which is, I think, exactly what you are trying to do, um, both you and the Plan-Based Transition Coalition that Eleanor represents have been working on this. So I'm so grateful to both of you for uh, spearheading this and for running with it you know uh, for me I, I the your words about getting close to uh, the, you quote tolstoy but getting close to the suffering when you see suffering don't walk away from it um that resonates so much okay, because people are suffering from climate change animals are suffering from climate change and our leaders are walking away. You know, they are basically not doing anything. And it is, it's up to us to go as close to the suffering as possible and address it and invite people to join us. So I see, you know, the same movement that you started, which was basically vigils for animals, uh, turning into something broader with the plant-based treaty. That's a that's a very good way to put it. Um, the you know the save the animal save movement started with the idea of everyone has the moral duty to bear witness, and mm -hmm. and Tolstoy defined it as uh, when you see a creature suffering, don't succumb to the initial desire to flee from the suffering mm -hmm. one, but come close as close as you can and try to help. And right. uh, there have been groups that have been bearing witness to climate impacts. And they would often have to go all the way to the Arctic to look at the uh, frightening melting of the ice. Mm -hmm. We don't have to go so far anymore. It's right in most people's communities. And that's why there's so much more climate anxiety because they, you're, there's so many communities that are experiencing climate impacts. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at uh, Hurricane Ida and the devastation it caused in um, uh, you know, New Orleans, and then uh, went all the way to the Northeast and flooded, you know, basements in New Jersey and uh, flooded mm -hmm. streets and homes. And there were right. dozens of people died. And then the, you know, and, and billions of animals are dying in the forest fires of British Columbia and California, Australia, the Amazon, uh, in um, the boreal forest in, Ru in, in Russia. It, it's mm -hmm. uh, um, people are experiencing extreme weather. Uh, the price of food is going up. There's an, there were the CNN reported 
uh, why are prices of food increasing wheat? And they said it was because of climate change. We just did a report the last couple of days. And in Britain, there are actually empty shelves for, for various reasons, including the increase, the, the scarcity of some food and the prices going up because of climate impacts. Uh, so that's part of, part of the reason that they're experiencing that. And if you talk to uh, Dr. Peter Carter, he's a physician, Mm -hmm. He's an IPCC reviewer. He 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 is very worried about food system collapse. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, there's a lot of indication that it, you know, if temperatures go above 30 degrees Celsius, that's when food systems start uh, breaking down. And mm -hmm. and you know, what's really concerning is that we're we're heading towards uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius a decade earlier than than the IPCC thought. They reported. Right. In sixth assessment report and that would be around 1930 sorry 2030 right and and uh so when the global temperature increases from 1.1 degrees celsius where it is now to 1.5 degrees celsius the way that actually appears in different regions is different so like, like in the u.s temperatures might go four to five degrees celsius higher because as you go higher in the la latitude the increases in temperatures uh are uh are higher so it's right. not like uh, you know, on average everywhere or everywhere in the world that the, the temperature will just go up by 0.4 degrees celsius that's not the case mm -hmm. some regions you'll have temperatures go, going up by three four or five degrees celsius within the next few years and we're already seeing uh you know extreme drought uh in in in, in california and other states we're seeing rivers dry up mm -hmm. uh you know, like the Colorado River, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing that in Turkey, there's rivers drying up, we're seeing all over the world, these things happening. And, uh, you know, it has huge implications for our, our for our food systems. Um, so if things are bad today, just imagine what they will be when, when the temperature goes up to 1.5 degrees Celsius, and um, we experience more extreme hurricanes and flooding, droughts, and so forth. And um, so yeah, it, it's very bad today, and we're already you know seeing the impacts. But they're going to get worse every year. Right. Um, and and um, obviously, we need we need to sh shift from business as usual, and we need to phase out fossil fuels and um, animal agriculture very quickly. And I know you've done work, Dr. Salash Rao, on the importance of focusing on animal agriculture and methane in particular, because uh, if we we can't just focus on fossil fuels because there's also a cooling effect from all the air pollution. But with addressing plant-based solutions, you have two benefits. You're, you're reducing these very potent greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxide, plus you're providing a solution because you can reforest more of the earth and absorb the carbon out of the atmosphere. So you right. have two benefits, whereas when you're dealing with fossil fuels, it's, it's a little trickier because as you reduce air pollution, the earth will heat up. So none right. of those problems with plant-based. So like, it's such an obvious solution for right. the next few years. And I know you're working on, you know, the year 2026. We do not want to have a world where, you know, there are where wildlife becomes effectively extinct. You know, right. and that's where we're heading with this business as usual. So there are very positive solutions uh, that we can work on. And I think we need a plant-based treaty and a fossil fuel treaty. And we really need to focus on the plant-based solutions right now. Right. You know, uh, the the trouble is in, in, in any situation where you have two choices, the choice between um, less harm, less profit option versus a more harm, more profit option, we have a tendency to pick the second that which causes more harm and more profit because it's because we are only measuring profit and we are saying you know we want to maximize that okay that's the system we are in so this is why this uh, dialogue today we're going to start by talking about the plant based treaty and then we're going to go on to talk about all the other implications of getting to a plant based food system and which will require us to rethink some of these measurements of how do we optimize our, um, and we all know this, right? We all know that we have a tendency to pick the more harm, more profit option uh, given these two choices. And in fact, 
those who don't pick that eventually become less successful in the system. The success is measured by profits at the moment. So uh, I'm, I'm so glad that, uh, Eleanor, you, the work that you're doing with the Plan-Based Transition Coalition is about getting multiple NGOs to come together, multiple organizations to come together to put combined pressure on governments from the bottom up. So tell us a bit about that and how, how is it going? Well, uh, you're absolutely right, right? As individuals, we can only have that much success, mm -hmm. but together our success, uh, success can be uh, magnified. So that's going to be the main objective, I would say, over the next six months, especially that we're in the time now with the UN Summit and the COP26 in November. Right. And at the same time, though, we have to address the entire education uh, system mm -hmm. because it's a combination of a push and pull strategy, right? We have to have the individuals, the citizens pulling. And there aren't enough today, apart from these groups that are very uh, focused on it. But the general population, I mean, my, my feeling, my reaction to the people that I speak to and so on that are not in the uh, plant-based uh, movement, uh, don't necessarily feel that there is a problem. And that in itself is a problem. And I remember one of the slides I had in my university presentations that if it's not happening right around you, then people just don't think there is a, is a problem uh, happening. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously this year with the, uh, the the droughts, the wildfires that we've had, it's been closer to home than it's ever been, but a lot of people are still not making the connection between uh, those events and our food system. So that's why mm -hmm. education is such an important area that, that we need to focus on. And I think that's one of the areas that the coalition um, as a group uh, we'll be uh, addressing over the next uh, few months. In even the textbooks, I mean, I'm textbook that is in her fifth grade. And they voting the idea that only source sound and dairy is the only source of calcium i mean this is you know i mean sort of indoctrinating them to our children at a very age okay and and so this is why i think 80 percent of americans are confused they think that meat is only found in protein and they're wondering why you know vegans are thriving right <laughs> it's, what do we do with this? I mean, this, this this goes to the very fundamentals of of education, right? It is. I mean, I I was so shocked. I mean, I asked um, uh, her school, "What are we going to do about this? You can't have this in the textbooks. You can't lie about lie to our children about these things." So how do we how do we get to the education departments? And how do we get because this is a this is uh, it's something that is so embedded in the system, the lying about this issue. Well, that, that's why we first started with universities, right? Mm. Much easier to address. You don't have the issue so much of protectionism from the, uh, the parents to the students, right? They're able to make their own decisions and, and so on. And even that has not been easy, right? We, we've had successes. I think it's moved along. Uh, awareness is a lot higher. Uh, mm -hmm. There definitely is interest. People are attending. The next one will be November 10th, featuring uh, Queen's University and the uh, PCRM. But then it's the next layer that's going to be more difficult, uh, the high schools and the grade schools, where there's a lot more involvement uh, from the parents. And uh, it's likely going to be a, a lot more uh, pushback. But at least here in Canada, the one thing that we can ask, it, it did come from the government, is the operationalization of the Canada Food Guide. You know, mm -hmm. So that is a fact. It's not something that's coming from us. It's a, it's a governmental uh, change that was made in 2019. 
Okay. So that's sort of the uh, first approach. And then secondly, with the default veg mentality. So, mm. okay, that's fine. If your child wants meat, they can have meat. But what we'd like to get them used to is a default of plant-based foods and then mm. sign up for something that's not. So it doesn't appear as draconian as saying no more meat and, and so on. So I think that could help uh, bring some success uh, to the program. And that we should be starting this fall. We'll see how that goes along. The default wedge, yeah. Well, uh, the the education system uh, covering the high schools and the grade schools. Oh, okay. Because yeah. the universities now has been a year. And so now the next step would be uh, the next level down. Yeah, but it, but it's, you know, someone is writing these textbooks. Right, someone is writing these textbooks and shipping it out to all the schools, and and they are inserting this right there, right at the outset. So by the time we get to university, you know, we are we have already um, been indoctrinated, and so we are now have to undo the damage that is done. It's a little bit like you know trying to mop up the floor after the sink has overflowed. Well, that's it. I mean, the problem in itself is already difficult. And as you say, because of the indoctrination of mm. the students and the parents, it just becomes much more uh, difficult. But I, I think to some degree, climate change will be in our favor, right? Because mm. we can show what the impacts and the lies have been in, in the past. Yeah, climate change is mother nature saying, you know, you better get aligned with the truth or else I'm going to exactly. take you out. So right. what's more important? I mean, every parent is concerned about their child's future. Right. And that to me is, is a big bonus for us because if you are concerned about your child's future, then you've got to start making this transition to plant-based. And this is why, you know, they haven't had that type of, uh, of education. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would add that, um, there are like many different sources of learning and uh, mm -hmm. we, we have an advantage with uh, street actions and social media. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, groups like Fridays for the Future, uh, Greta, you know, she's vegan for ethical and environmental reasons and she's beginning to speak up more about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we have uh, Genesis Butler, uh, who started Youth Climate Save uh, a couple years ago. And now we have more than 70 chapters around the world on every every continent. Um, and th their focus is to put the link between the animal agriculture and climate at the forefront. And um, so, uh, you know, that's social. So when they do street actions, uh, that is a source of learning. And uh, and then also social media is a very important source. So I think it's very it's very good when we put out as many videos as possible about with testimonials or showing the kinds of uh, actions we're doing and also educating people about these issues. Um, it, it really does make a difference. So there's lots that we can do. Um, right. So, yeah. No, I mean, you have to keep at it, uh, obviously. Uh, is there a push within the plan-based treaty to, um, to get organizations to have a default wedge policy? Anyone who endorses it should have a default wedge policy or something like yeah, that. Yeah, we haven't done that yet. I mean, it's, yeah. it's we only started this campaign four months ago, and um, we will it will have more and more um, guides and things to do. Um, mm -hmm. but no, we haven't haven't done work on that yet, but that's it's a, it's a great idea. Uh, we do have guides on things that schools can do, and we just ask that they veganize their menus, do as and have a timeline. I. I um, and we give other examples of what they can do, like start a vegetable garden at school, uh, mm -hmm. you know, give out right. seeds. Uh, so yeah, it's all very solutions based. Uh, you know, at this point, we're just calling for them to veganize the menus. Um, we have uh, um, a page uh, about how 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 people can you know take the challenge twenty two challenge do the twenty two two day challenge with. Uh, right. Uh, with the group called Challenge 22, um, and we have a couple of other examples of those that people can sign on to, and they'll get daily emails. So yeah, it's it's we're, we're it's very solutions based and just helping people, uh, you know, uh, 
run with it and, and do do as much as they can. Um, but yeah, um, right. I mean, ultimately, you know, we see this this solution that's staring us in the face, and we see all these problems around us. And why wouldn't you go grab the solution? Right? <laughs> What's wrong with us, right? If we don't grab the solution, that's right, staring at us three times a day in front of our faces. Yeah, right under our noses. So. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think the psychology is because I do talk to a lot of people, like even in my neighborhood here, nobody thinks there's a problem. You know, they only, they're just business as usual every day. And if it gets hotter, well, it gets hotter. That, that's the attitude that really needs to change because, right. you know, I, I, we're, we're into the movement and, and we know what's happening. But the far greater portion of the population, uh, both through apathy partly apathy, ignorance, and just, you know, they just don't care, are, are not prepared to change anything. They've been vaccinated against it. You know, they pretty much are in, uh, inoculated against yes. change. The, the system wants us to be empathetic. I have these discussions all the time, especially when they're, they have little children, you know, then I take the opportunity to speak to them. And I said, well, you know, what about your, your child's future? Uh, you know, it's going to get hotter. So, well, he'll be hot. <laughs> That's, those are the types of answers generally that people will come back with. I, I think like most people have no idea how bad the climate crisis is. Yeah. And, uh, and it's a very complicated issue. You have to like learn about it, study it a lot uh, to just understand how the scale of it and, and, so I think, you know, I agree with you, Eleanor, like our, one, our most important project is just like education. So I, I think most people just don't know. Um, people are beginning to experience climate impacts uh, in a way they never have before. I mean, July was the hottest month on record, and that's almost like 150 years of records. And, mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, and people, because our movement is global, I talk to people around the world and like in mm -hmm. Turkey, uh, our activists were rescuing animals from incredible forest fires, incredible heat waves. Uh, they, you know, one of our activists said they never saw a tornado before. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, in uh, Canada on the west coast, uh, the town of Lytton burned down. Its temperatures right. around 50 degrees Celsius. That's unheard of. Right. Uh, in a lot of parts of the world, the, the, it never gets too hot, so they don't have air conditioning or fans. Um, so I, one of our activists in England uh, never experienced such heat waves as this summer, and she had a, she, she didn't have a fan or anything, so she had to sleep with a wet towel at night. That was the first time she ever did that. Right. So when you have more, because because as a global movement, I hear the stories of our regular activists around the world, and they're all experiencing things that they never right. experienced before. So clearly, things are changing, and. Right. Um, I think there is a lot of climate anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe in the United States, you know, the level of education is not that high with respect to climate. Um, you know, there's a very, uh, you know, the, the, the right wing media doesn't even report on it, denies, still denies climate chaos. Um, right. Even the, 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 the more liberal media does not report on it enough, although you're seeing, you know, a little more now with the climate impacts. Um, right. They've done a poor job. I think the media generally has done a very poor job in reporting on the climate. And that's why there's a group of journalists that got together just to talk about climate coverage. So right. like climate coverage now or something, there's a group, right. which includes the Guardian and other groups. Uh, so clearly there's a problem with media in just reporting on the climate chaos. Uh, there's a problem in schools, like just how do you, it's a very complex subject and it's it's a very difficult subject but i think people need to learn the basics and just understand you know what is global warming what is the greenhouse effect what are the, what are the two main causes of the climate crisis you know it's the mm -hmm. fossil fuel energy system and it's animal agriculture and most you know a lot of people don't know that right uh, so i think you know we got a lot of education to do um mm -hmm. and that's our job is just to get the message out and i think you know, once people are educated and they know about the linkage, they're more likely to change their behavior.
Miles is saying that we need to be calling it the whole planetary system crisis, not just a climate crisis. So, so um, he's right. No. It's everything is coming together and saying, you have to change your way of life. And one of the um, reasons that I cite for, for the inaction top down is that George went to the Rio summit in 1992 and said the American way of life is not negotiable. Okay. And I don't know if he meant that colonialism is not negotiable, racism is not negotiable. Did he really mean that? I don't think so. I'd rather interpret that to mean that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is not negotiable. And but then we are not we are not really implementing that right now. So that requires us to change in order to implement that. So that's how you honor his memory. Yeah. As as opposed to blindly saying uh, Mac McDonald's hamburgers are not negotiable. <laughs> Even those we can make them plant based and you can have your hamburgers, but it's plant based, right? Yeah. So it, it is education and it is um, spreading the word. You know, it's, it is. And he was, he actually, George Bush wanted to be the education president, by the way. So that was his, um, his drive to educate people. So it is important that we carry that legacy forward and let's educate people. Well, maybe I could give a little happy story because I know, you know, how, how difficult it can be. But uh, this week, um, one of my daughter's friends came over and she has a daughter in grade two mm. who had seen the movie Babe and okay. no longer wants to eat meat, like totally went off meat. So I went and bought them some vegan uh, sandwich uh, slices kind of thing. And uh, she came over to uh, to pick them up. But here is, you know, a grade two student who decided on her own to mm -hmm. go vegan. So if parents would let us access their children in terms of education rather than, you know, preventing that, I think we'd be a lot more successful in, in the grade schools if we showed them what was allowed. And I have asked my, uh, I also have a grandchild in, in uh, grade school. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you should talk about these things at, at school. And he said, the teacher said it's not appropriate. So we're getting resistance from the teaching uh, community that right. we shouldn't frighten the other children or talk about these things. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite complex. And that's why I, I think it's somewhat easier to kind of work down the chain, you know, mm -hmm. universities, high schools, and, and then uh, grade schools because of the resistance that, that we're going to face in the grade schools. Yeah, we have you know, the phenomenon of climate anxiety now among the youth. Oh, young people are feeling anxious about the future. It, it's important to show them there is a world, that actually you are here at this amazing time in human history when you can make this transformation happen to a completely plant-based food system. And just think about it, right? That's so amazing that you're here at this time to do this. Uh, who else? Which other generation can say that? I know. Right? Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. But, you know, one of the things we, we haven't really uh, talked about in the impediments to it is the influence on the governments by the, the fuel industry and the animal ag industry, which has become so big now. Mm -hmm. you know? So that's going to be a very big challenge because governments here, I mean, we haven't really heard anything positive with respect to what they're going to change. And that, to me, is the the lobbyists and the you know the mega corporations that really right. have that control. And uh, you know when they talk about jobs and money and so on. So that's another huge challenge. So we we have it in a few areas here that make this very very difficult. 
Yeah, but I see those as part of the current system. Um, and so, you know, and they're supposed to do what they're supposed to do. They are the caterpillars, you know. And so you can't expect a caterpillar to transform to a butterfly um, from the top down. It actually begins from the inside out, right? So it's every cell changes and then and then the whole caterpillar melts and becomes a butterfly. So we really have to create a butterfly system, right? Like uh, Buckminster Fuller said, right? We, you have to just create something new that there's no volume. I think the internet just froze for a bit. Yes, I'm just going to write a note. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Completely. Dr. Salvador. Uh -huh. Yes, I, I agree with you, Dr. Silas Rao. Like, it's very much the changes have to come from the bottom up. And uh, I think historically, like a lot of the positive changes we've seen have used that, that method. So um, if you, you know, the non-proliferation, the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty uh, specifically outlines this bottom-up approach. And it was looking at the nuclear non-proliferation treaty and how that came about. It's a global treaty. And uh, that started at the city level with, with a number of cities endorsing it, you know, with nuclear free zones or, you know, passing resolutions for non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. And then states supported it and then countries. And and so um, I, I just think it's a, it's a good uh, role model. Uh, it's happened in other areas too. If you look at the ozone depleting substances, uh, a lot of those initiatives started at the grassroots level and getting cities to pass resolutions. Um, for example, Boston passed an early resolution to call for the elimination of CFCs uh, and other ozone depleting substances. And then the state of Massachusetts endorsed that idea. And then, you know, eventually national governments negotiated the Montreal Protocol that banned uh, chlorofluorocarbons. And now the ozone layer had a, has had a chance to repair itself. So, uh, you know, hopefully the same thing will happen with the global climate agreement, you know, start at the, you know, bottom up levels uh, and, uh, and then and it will grow from there. So yeah, very much agree with you, Dr. Salish Rao, that, you know, change often starts, most often, is bottom up. There's very few times that there's a global global leader that's enlightened, you know, and is you know doing something exemplary. It's very rare. I mean, it happens on occasion, but it's extremely rare. Right. Yeah. Because it's the system. The system is designed to protect those who have already created, I mean, already have the power. So it's maintained that. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And so I expect that as a systems engineer, I expect that system to be stable. Otherwise. I think we're having just a little bit of internet issues here. Yes, intermittent. Yes. Um, well, you know, to your so point, but, uh, can you? Sorry, we we couldn't hear you. There was no voice, uh, Doctor Selish. Uh, it, yeah, it's and bringing. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's. I think this is Mother Nature saying, um, close it out. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Yeah, it's been a fascinating conversation. And thank you, uh, thank you so much for, for your efforts. For And it's it's my honor and privilege to be working alongside you. Well, well thank you so much. It's, it's, it's really our, our, our privilege. And, and thank you. You know, for for working so hard to to, you know, outline some of these issues that are finally being recognized by the IPCC. I know you were very happy with the sixth assessment report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the Science Working Group. Uh, you said finally, finally, they recognize that we have a methane emergency, and you've been saying this for years. And right. um, um, finally, the IPCC is catching up. The Guardian is doing some good reporting, which you're happy about on the climate emergency and the problem of animal agriculture. So 
uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully there'll be more and more recognition of some of the things you've been talking about for years and uh, that we move quickly uh, on these issues. And I think the plant-based treaty provides, you know, a nice sort of framework where you can create this bottom-up pressure. So I'm asking all your viewers to please just go to the homepage and endorse the treaty. It just takes a minute. Uh, so so I, I really appreciate it because uh, the more people that endorse it, the stronger we will be in uh, putting pressure on governments to negotiate a global treaty. So we really need people like I, I really need all your help to just get people to endorse the treaty uh, as individuals. And if they know any businesses or groups, you know, please just endorse the treaty as a group. You just upload your logo and then we add you to the list of groups on, on the website. So I'd really, really appreciate it if you could do that. And if you could, you know, get your friends and family to do that. Yeah, I put on the chat. Uh, so everyone should be able to see that. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. And I'd like to thank you as well, Dr. Salash. Really, uh, you definitely give us hope. You've united a lot of people on a common cause and um, hoping that together, you know, we all work very hard and, and spread all these initiatives that, that we're doing, that we will see success over the next uh, few years. And uh, thanks to you as well, Anita, for the plant-based treaty. I, I think that was a really great initiative, especially the fact that it was uh, very global. So thanks to you and your team. Okay. Likewise, thanks, yeah. Eleanor. Well, hopefully we'll work together with the plant-based transition coalition. So Yes, yes, that'd be great. Thank and, you. And climate healers. And and continue to work with Dr. Salish Rayo on, 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 on all the projects you're working on, including, um, you know, year zero, 2026. Um, of course, I promise. <laughs>